Good morning. Welcome back. We're going to keep talking about neural networks today. Um, I'm sure you want to, that's the last thing you want to do. You've probably seen way too much of it in the last 48 hours. Um, I'm going to go over some of the design choices that um, you may have had to face and then talk about what's good about neural networks, what's not so good, um, their limitations as of 10, 15 years ago, and then the rest of the talk is going to be about what's been happening in the last 10 years. Deep learning. So we're finally going to do deep learning. Um, I'm going to start with some really basic things that I think you probably figured out on your own, but it's worth mentioning. Um, neural networks are quintessentially useful for continuous inputs and continuous outputs, but they're also useful when your inputs are something else and when your outputs are something else. So um, starting with inputs, if your input is um, binary, you could just use two, two dis different uh, numerical values. Does it, I mean, for example, zero and one. Does it have to be zero and one? No, it doesn't have to be zero and one. Any two values, you would have effectively the same representation power, but maybe not the same search behavior. So let's take it to a large number of inputs. Suppose you have um, as input a category so in addition to some inputs, you have another set of inputs which just indicate a category. One way of doing that is by identifying each input with a particular category, and that category gets a 1 and all the others get a 0. Or get that category gets some value and all the other ones get another value. Does it matter which values you choose? The answer is, for representational power, it doesn't. For the hard bias, it doesn't. But for the search, it might. So think about the inputs that go into any any one of the hidden units. The rough rule of thumb is that when the network starts its training, you want the sum of the inputs to be not zero, but close to zero. Or more generally, you want it to be in the area of the transfer function that has a fairly steep gradient. If you start your training in such a way that the input to some of the network start far out here or far out here, it's going to take many, many iterations to get out of there. Um, not only because it is far out, but because the gradient, most importantly, because the gradient there is very, very flat. So the movements, the, the steps that you will take are going to be very small, because remember that gradient descent moves not only in the direction of the gradient, but proportionately to the size, to the steepness of the gradient. So the general rule of thumb is you want the total net that goes into any hidden unit to be in the interesting section of your transfer function or activation function. It's the same thing. Transfer function, activation function. Um, now let's talk about the output. How do you encode your output? Again, if your output is numerical, it's straightforward. If your output is categorical, you have choices. Uh, the choice that you faced in your binary classification task is if you, you could use a single output and declare it, you know, zero is one of the category, category one, and one is category two. It's a single output with a threshold. Um, the alternative is, well, let's actually make it a little bit harder. Suppose you have five categories. Could you still use a single output? The answer is yes, you could. 
although it's probably not a good idea. So let's first see how you would do that. Um, if you have a single output and it's a sigmoid output, you could declare five bands. The output in this range would be category one, this would be category two, this would be category three, four, and five. Could you learn a multi-way classification this way? Maybe, but it'll be very, very hard for several reasons. One reason is that these solutions are not stable. They're in a narrow band at a steep gradient. So you cannot learn them to the point of telling the network you're very, very sure of the answer because you're always very close to a decision boundary for another category. Um, as opposed to if you learn just two categories, you can push the answer, you can make the weight stronger and stronger and push the answer further this way and further that way. You can separate your answers. You can show in your output how certain you are about the answer. You can't do that if you're overloading a single output neuron. That's one reason. A second reason has to do with what these categories are. Um, if they are just generic categories, they have nothing to do with each other, then the order in which you put them is, is arbitrary, and that would imply funny math in the sense that if you are very sure that it's category two, then you're beginning to suspect it might be category three. You're getting close to category three. Sometimes that's useful. Suppose your output is not strictly categorical, but rank categorical. Suppose you're trying to guess um, if someone did, somebody is going to perform terribly, badly, average, well, or extremely well. Okay? These are rank categories. In that case, you do want to take advantage of the fact that they, there is a natural ordering to it. So the alternative, which the much, the much more stable and um, commonly used alternative, is to have one output for each category, one output associated with each category. This is category one, this is category five. Um, and then the training, the teaching signal would be one at the correct category and zero at all the others. And the output, the interpretation of the output of the train network would be, if you're choosing one, choose the one that's the highest, the winner take all principle, the maximum. Or alternatively, if you are interested not in just a single category, but a posterior distribution over the categories, then normalize the outputs um, and use them as a distribution, perhaps reflecting your degree of confidence in each output. You've probably encountered these issues, had to deal with them, had to make decisions, um, but I wanted you to know you had a choice and what the consequences of the choices are. Questions so far? Okay. Mm -hmm. If I assign one into one category, this kind of encoding can be used for both binary and multi-way. If you assign one, so, uh, one and then all the are you talking about input or output? Input. You could use that as a way to encode a categorical input. What if my output should be binary? This is input. Output is a completely separate consideration. You could make an independent design choices in both of them. Okay, we started talking about what the bias of neural networks is. Um, I don't know if you remember that. Do you remember? What did we say was a soft bias? Sorry? Number of units. I'm talking about a characterization of the kind of functions that the networks will will tend to converge towards. Yeah. So if we start with the weights close to zero, <clears throat> we're kind of preferring linear relationships. That's exactly right. 
When we start, we start with very small weights. Um, and I just mentioned, again, that one of the principles should be that we should start with a weighted sum of inputs that is close to the middle of this range. So in the, in the limit, uh, where the weights are small enough that all the weighted combinations in the first layer of hidden units, the net in is close to zero, a weighted combination of very small weights will give you something like zero. Um, that means that in, you're operating in this range, and this range is reasonably well approximated by a straight line. So that means you're using effectively a linear transfer function, approximately, in that range. As you move away from that range, that, that approximation becomes less, less good. And then the next layer, uh, because you're operating in this range, the output is also small and close to zero. And therefore, the next layer, with its own small weights, will also implement something that's approximately linear. And on and on, to a point, of course, it's all an approximation. But overall, you could say in the limit, as the weights go towards zero, the network is implementing something that's closer and closer to a linear mapping. As you start your training, the weights start growing. And some of the units would leave this linear zone and start curving this way or that way. Now you're introducing nonlinearities. It would only happen if the gradient descent pushes you in that direction, which means that the bias of a network is towards being linear, towards being simple, and it deviates from it only when the data demands it. This is a very, very nice bias because it's not very strong. It's not specific to any particular domain. It just makes the assumption that things should be smooth and simple unless told otherwise, which is a bias, right? As a mathematician, most functions are not smooth and are not simple. Um, it's a very generic kind of bias. We will see it again when we discuss non-parametric methods. Um, I want to show you a very um, nice example of how it, sometimes you can visualize this kind of bias. So this example is taken from speech recognition. Um, and it's the very simple task of recognizing, oops, recognizing um, a vowel from a short segment of speech. So the short segment of speech was first processed using digital uh, signal processing techniques, specifically applying Fourier transform to it to detect where is most of the energy in that signal. Uh, and the two frequencies that carry the most uh, energy are called the first two formants, and this is what is represented in the input. So the input is already a processed version of the recorded speech. This is an important point. This is feature engineering. We'll talk about it in a minute. So somebody who knows something about speech decided in advance what aspects of the recording, what aspects of the acoustics are important for that decision. And they made that decision. They did the processing ahead of time without machine learning, just uh, using their engineering domain knowledge, um, and represented each input as two numerical values, first formant and second formants. Uh, and then it's a single hidden layer network with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven network, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 outputs. The 10 outputs are of the type that I described earlier, corresponding to categories, winner take all categories. So the categories are the different vowels, like uh, e in head, and e in hid, and o in hod, and so forth. The network was trained on the large number of examples using BEP propagation. And once the network was trained and did reasonably well, it was frozen. And then to map what the network does, we drew here uh, the two formants. It's measured in hertz, first formant, second formant. And for every um, one of our training examples, 
we took its representation informants and threw it on, um, on this 2D plot with the symbol indicating its label, its correct label. That's one thing. The second thing that was done here was these decision boundaries. The way these decision boundaries was calcu were calculated was through brute force, scaling the entire um, uh, grid, XY grid here, and for every point, calculating what, which is the winning, fitting it into the network, propagating it forward, deciding on the correct label, and then deciding where the boundaries are. Okay? So this was done not analytically, but by brute force. The interesting thing about this is the shape of the, of the um, classes. So you can see the classes here. This is all the huh, as in hood, and this is all the Ba, 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 hot, can't even make these sounds. Um, the shapes are not nice and straight, but they're also not arbitrary. They're not going like this. There's a clear preference towards smooth lines that separate the data as best as possible. This is what neural networks know how to do. They know how to form boundaries when used as uh, classifiers. They know how to form decision boundaries that can curve as necessary, but otherwise remain smooth, which kind of corresponds to what you and I would do, right? If you were given these training examples without these boundaries, only the dots, only the symbols, and you were asked to draw decision boundaries, chances are they would look similar to these. What kind of problems are neural networks good for? Anything? Everything? What kind of problems are they not good for? What if um, you're trying to figure out the weighting scheme, weighting scheme for um, a, f a final course grade uh, as a combination of its input, uh, a combination of the grades of assignments and, and homework. Are neural networks good for that? Yes. Yes? Why? continuous, okay, okay. It depends on how you define your outputs and what your metrics are for a good curve or a good grading scheme. So you, it depends on how you define your output and what your matrix are, metrics are for a good uh, solution. Uh, let me pick a fight with the second one. Uh, your metric for a good solution you can encode in your error function. Yeah, that's what I mean. Is it depends on what you choose. Like, okay. Of course, if you choose a better function, you'll get a better solution, but uh, I was asking about the use of neural networks as a whole as opposed to something else. If you're trying to figure out the weighing scheme for grades or for any kind of ranking, go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, for this kind of thing, people will want transparency, and it's not easy to say um, with neural network what kind of factor you like to put to the grade. Right, if you're trying to reverse engineer a weighing scheme, um, people would typically want transparency. They would want to know um, th what the solution is, to be able to understand the solution and to decide if they believe it or not. And that's hard to get from a neural network, that is true. But um, if you're trying to figure out a weighting scheme, guys, this is a linear problem. For a linear problem, you don't need a neural network. I mean, don't overkill, right? Don't do more than necessary. If you know, if you have reason to believe it's a neural network, it's a, it's a linear scheme, 
Use linear regression. You like neurons? Use a single linear neuron. It's the same thing. But you don't need to use a whole network. Okay? So the first thing to remember is, do you even need a neural network? Neural networks go beyond linear. So let's try to determine what they are. ANNs are, they're for the most part regressors. They do regression, although they can be co-opted as we saw to do classification. They're regressors. Second, we say they're nonlinear regressors. They can do linear, but it will be an overkill. What else do we know about them? What did we say their bias is? Smoothness? Anything else? Beyond the fact that they can do nonlinear stuff and that they're smooth, they're pretty much generic. Yes, if you restrict the topology, there may be some things you can't do, but if you don't restrict the topology, if you talk about neural networks in general, um, they can implement anything. And in fact, even with a single layer, they can approximate any function. That was proven, uh, and I mentioned that in class. So I would here uh, add the word universal. So neural networks are, first of all, universal regressors, but they're nonlinear and smooth for the most part. That's their smoothness is their soft bias. Um, one very important point that was just made is they are sometimes hard to understand and interpret. So they're not transparent. We mentioned that when we talked about decision trees. Decision trees are very transparent. You can give someone the tree you trained, and they look at it and say, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Oh, I didn't know. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. You know, they can argue with it. They can discuss with it. They can think of what it means. You give them a neural network with 10,000 weights, they need to do some work to, to visualize it like the example I showed you. That was not obvious from the trained network. You need to actually do some work to understand how it does what it does. Um, how are they about, how are neural networks about noise? Are they good dealing with noise? Not so good, compare them to decision trees or to um, something else? They're better than decision trees. They are better than decision trees. A related um, issue is they have lower variance than decision trees. So remember, again, the variance of a method has to do with how different is the final learned function based on different samples from the same distribution. So if we both got samples of the same size from the same distribution, but two different samples, and you use the same, exact same algorithm, how different will the outcome tend to be? High variance means they tend to be quite different. Low variance means, to be, means they tend to be similar. Decision trees are notoriously high variance. That's why we need a variety of techniques to reduce that variance, like to train many, many trees on different types and average the result. Neural networks actually have relatively low variance. Of course, it all depends on how much data you have versus how many, how many um, units, or how many parameters. But for the most part, it's fairly gracious when it comes to, uh, to noise um, and to variance in samples. What about computational considerations? How do they compare to linear regression, um, decision trees, or any of the other algorithms we discussed? Yeah? Uh, no, that was to be computationally heavy to train, but then once you get the train weights, it's uh, very fast. Hard to train, easy to use.
Many times it's not a problem, you train once. But if you're in a setting where you constantly get new data and you, um, and, or you constantly have to train or you train and you only use it a couple of times, then you need to consider that. If you get new data, if you have a million data points and you get another thousand every day or week or something, neural networks are actually better than decision trees in that regard. Because you can start from the starting point from, last, from yesterday's neural network, throw in the data and run more iterations. You can make adjustments that way. It does not guarantee that you would get the best answer, but nothing in neural network learning guarantees that anyway. Uh, in decision trees, uh, the problem is more severe because if you get more data, if you retrain with the new expanded data, it may make changes in the root. There's no natural way of making uh, incremental change in the tree. I mean, there's some. You can grow the bottom a little more, but you're pretty much settled more so than in neural networks. So if you are getting uh, incremental data, neural networks may have an advantage there. One other interesting aspect of uh, neural networks is that they sometimes develop uh, internal representations. What we mean by that is that if you look at a uh, feed-forward network, here are your inputs, here's one layer and maybe another layer and maybe an output. You can focus on one input and say, what excites this input, uh, one neuron, and say, what excites this neuron? What combinations of values here makes it activate the most? This idea comes from neuroscience, where it has a name. Um, the set of stimuli that tend to activate a particular neuron in the brain the most are called its receptive field. In the visual processing pathway in our visual cortex, we know quite a bit about the receptive fields of the different neurons. In the very first layer, there are neurons that are uh, most excited by a particular um, either dots or lines at particular orientations in, in your visual field. And there are many, many of these neurons, and each one of them is excited about a particular orientation. Um, and then in the next layer after that, they're excited by specific combinations of these orientations that lead to specific shapes. So it's as if the neurons specialize in extracting that features. In fact, this is what they do. They extract a feature. So you can think of our visual processing system and later on some of our artificial neural networks as a cascade of feature extractions, where in the first layer from the input, you extract the most basic features that are very simple functions of the input. And then in the next layer up, there would be more advanced features. And this could continue for many, many layers where you build a hierarchy of features. Each set of features is defined in terms of the features that were below it in the hierarchy. This corresponds to this notion that we figure out what's in the image in a hierarchical way by first figuring out where the, the uh, black and white is, then figure out where lines are and what orientation they are, then figure out from that uh, what the um, combination of lines are that form shapes, and then figuring out from that some 3D representation and so forth. There's good evidence that this is how, how our brains do that. This is not limited to vision, but it is very, very common in image processing. So in speech processing, you can have very similar things, uh, although in different domains. Um, and in, in general, in areas where you have a very large number of inputs, which is what neural networks are good at, uh, the quintessential example is image. So we're going to stick with that, with that example. So in image, 
it is no longer useful to represent the input as a line. Uh, it makes much more sense to represent it as a two-dimensional structure, like a, a rectangle of input. So we will make these our inputs. I'm putting lines here, but these are really pixels. So maybe I should change to a pixel representation. Um, now imagine that you have a thousand by a thousand of those in your. Uh, and now any one of the basic features might get excited by a specific combination of these features in a specific part of the scene. So, for example, they might be looking for a circle right here. It is fairly easy to imagine, uh, so you have lots of inputs here. It's fairly easy to imagine uh, a single sigmoid unit that gets excited when there is a circle here and nothing else. Now, question. The way they get excited is from the weights, from the, from the actual, how much uh, each pixel will take. Right. But we are changing the weights through training. Right. So, so doesn't that let the features change? Right? Good point. Uh, the, the features depend on the weights heavily. So I was switching here without being explicit between talking about the representation and talking about how you learn the representation. So I apologize for that. Let me make it clear, I'm not, for, for the next five minutes, I'm not talking about the learning process. I'm talking just about good solutions in a network. Solutions that we find in the brain and solutions that we can either engineer ourselves into a neural network or learn automatically. So I'm talking about representation, I'm not talking about learning. Um, so this new one could be in charge of getting active whenever there's a circle here. But I want to know if there's a circle anywhere, and I, I want to know where. So maybe another neuron would be in charge of finding a circle here with lots of connections. And then another one will be in charge of finding a circle here. So we will have a whole bunch of neurons each responsible for finding a circle in a different area. We would say that each one of them have a different receptive field. Now the structure of the weights going into each one of them would be the same, but it would be on different part of the input field. That's if we were designing it, engineered it by hand. And this is how it is in the brain, although we don't know exactly how it's engineered, how it's done. So we're used to talking until now about a fully interconnected network where all the inputs are connected to all the uh, units in the hidden layer. It doesn't have to be the case, or even if it's fully connected, all the other connections into here could be zero, effectively making them non-existent. Or you can decide in advance, since you want this layer to be about finding local features, you can decide in advance to connect each hidden unit only to the area on uh, in charge of which its, you know, its computation is. So what I'm talking about here is the notion that hidden units could be thought of as extracting specific features. And in the case of an image, those features could be localized. And the same feature in different location in the image is technically considered a separate feature, but might have the same solution in terms of value of the weights. So we'll write that as hidden units as feature extractors. Extractors. Now sometimes What's not, I said that neural networks are not transparent, but sometimes you get a glimpse of how they do what they do by looking at the receptive field of specific neurons. How do you look at the receptive field? The one thing you can do is just look at the distribution of weights coming in, 
for example, to a, a, a unit that would um, get active when there's a circle here, chances are it would have positive weights along the circle and negative weights everywhere else. So that if this entire area was active, it will not, uh, it will not get activated because the negative weights here will cancel the positive weights here. So I want to show you another example of um, very nice detection of receptive fields. This is one of the early success stories of neural networks, already 20 years old, but it showed the power of training a neural network. This is for automatically driving a car. Um, the network is extremely simple. This is the input. The input is a th about a thousand pixels, 32 by 30 or 32, yeah, 30 by 32. Uh, this comes from an, a camera, video camera mounted on the dashboard of a car. Um, they go into a single hidden layer of four units. It doesn't get much simpler than that, just four units. And then it goes out into 30 outputs that are, again, winner take all, uh, except they are ranked categorical. They're not just categorical in the sense that they are, there's a natural ordering, uh, which was not taken advantage of here, I think. Uh, where if this is the winner, that means go straight ahead. If this is the winner, it means take a sharp right. If this is the winner, make, take a sharp left. So basically instructions for a steering wheel, how to steer the, the car. Okay. Um, what you see here is the receptive field of one of these four units. Each one of these four units is connected to the entire 30 by 32 matrix. And what you see here, these are called Hinton diagrams. Um, I think they got the term when Hinton, Jeff Hinton was here at CMU. Um, white is positive weights, black is negative weights. The larger the weights, the larger the size of the black or white patch, the larger the value of the weight is. What you're seeing here is the receptive field uh, of, I don't know which one of these four units. And basically it says that this unit will get activated the most when there is something in the image that looks like this, and, there, and maybe something here, but there's nothing here. So the observation that was made in the 80s, and maybe in the 90s, is that even though neural networks are kind of obtuse, they're not clear, they're not transparent, every now and then you can get a sense that they l discovered something on their own. And then the question becomes, how can you teach them to discover these features, to discover useful features on their own? So this became the sort of one of the major stumbling blocks in, in using neural networks for more complicated problems. It's the, it's the classic problem of AI. If I knew what are useful features, useful intermediate results on the way to my final output, I could program it in. If I don't know what it is, is there a way for the network to search the space and find good features. It turns out that the problem of feature engineering, of feature discovery, is as hard as the original problem. Because a good feature could be basically the feature that says, is this yes or no? Is this the right answer? So there's no, there's no distinction between feature and output. But yet, the way we think about it is the intermediate steps. And how can we find those intermediate steps? So this brings us to the last decade. So neural networks are wonderful. We're back in 2000. Uh, neural networks are generic, universal approximators. You can throw anything at them, and they do a surprisingly good job many times. You can train them with one generic uh, algorithm, backpropagation algorithm, that uh, you don't need to know anything about the domain. But they, they're only good up to a point. What are the limitations? Um, one is, is to learn um, complex functions, very complex functions from lots of data, 
from lots of data is expensive, computationally expensive. They were significantly more computationally demanding than other techniques um, used as, as competitors. It was notoriously difficult to train neural networks for large problems. It's doubly difficult because as the problem is more complex, you need more training data and the computation is proportional first to the amount of training data and second to the number of weights in your network. And as you are gearing towards bigger problems, you need bigger networks and more data, and you get hit twice. And also the uh, convergence time of back propagation would also probably grow with that. So you have the number of iterations as well. So you have like a cubic, roughly speaking, growth. Problem number two is the one I just referred to is learning useful intermediate representations. These are the hierarchies of features we're talking about. How to learn that automatically rather than to come from the outside and feature engineer it. The third problem was learning In multiple, net, in multiple layers, multiple layer networks, multiple hidden layers, I'll call it. Most of the attempts people made, the vast majority of experimentation with neural networks was done with a single hidden layer, maybe two. People realize that if they are trying to learn something more complex, they need to learn it hierarchically. There need to be a way for the network to extract features and then extract features of features and then do a serial kind of processing on the features to get to the answer. So to get to recognizing a dog or recognizing your grandma, you need to first start with the lines and orientations and so forth. But working with multiple layers proved computationally problematic and let me try to explain why when you try when you train a multi-layered network um, remember the training is taking the derivative of the error with regard to each weight and that the change in the weight is proportional to that. That's the essence of gradient descent. If you calculate the derivative of each one of the weights here, this weight or this weight or this weight or this weight, any amount of the many, many weights in this network, uh, if you remember how we do the calculation, the bare propagation algorithm, it's a recursive calculation that starts with here and then works out the derivative recursively as you go down. If you look at the formulas, every, um, every time you pass through a layer, you take the derivative of the, of the transfer function, the activation function, the sigmoid, and it gets compounded. Now look at the transfer function itself. What, is the, um, what are the bounds of the derivative of this function? Where is it steepest? It's steepest here. And what is the value here? It's a quarter. Um, if you remember, the derivative of the sigmoid is sigmoid times 1 minus the sigmoid. Remember that handy little formula? Sigmoid itself is between 0 and 1, 
and one minus sigmoid is also between zero and one. So the product is limited to being between zero and one. And in fact, it gets its maximum when the sigmoid is at half, um, and uh, that would be a quarter. So every time you pass through the network, every time you calculate the derivative of, of a, a weight that's further down, you're multiplying through things that are at most a quarter, but chances are after you did some training, they get pushed further out and they become even less than a quarter. So you're multiplying together a large number of small numbers. And therefore, the derivative, the gradient with regard to errors, I'm sorry, the gradient with regard to weights that are low near the input are going to be very, very small. And therefore, your convergence is going to be very, very small. And by very small, I mean exponentially small in the number of layers. So what happens in practice with multi-layer network is that these units learn fairly quickly what they need to learn. These units learn them much more slowly, and this more slowly and more slowly. And it's worse than that. Because what these units learn is relative to whatever these units fed them. And if you start training the network with random weights, what you're getting is random function. So the inputs that lead into each one of these are pretty random. They're not related in any meaningful way to what the output should be. The network is learning in the wrong direction. If we think about learning to recognize your grandmother from an image, if you had to write that, if you had to engineer that yourself, would you say, OK, first I need to see if grandma is with grandpa, and uh, then I have to define what grandpa is, and grandpa is wearing a jacket, and I have to define what jacket is? You're not going to start from the top down. You're going to do the opposite. You're going to start from the bottom up. You have to first define regions of interest, and then lines, and shapes, and recognize objects and then the relationships within the objects and so forth. You're going to build hierarchical learning from low level features to high level features. What backpropagation does is exactly the wrong thing. It, it, the, most of the learning in terms of movement of the gradient is happening here based on garbage. The movements here is, is extremely slow because of this multiplication of gradients. Um, when this finally gets to somewhere that it's meaningful, then the next layer can start converging in a more meaningful way. So as a result, training a network of even five layers proved not very, very helpful. Question? Is this a consequence of the backprop algorithm or of gradient descent? The backprop algorithm is gradient descent, but you're asking, uh, can you do gradient descent in a different way? So the, the backup algorithm is just a uh, handy way of using dynamic programming to figure out what the gradients are. But the gradients are what they are. So I would answer that it is gradient, it's a function of gradient descent and it's a function of the topology of the network. So when you're trying to learn something complex, you're going from input through something that inherently requires many, many steps to get to the output it's an inherently difficult problem, right? Because nobody tells you what the steps should be. Doing it the traditional way with backpropagation is a wrong-headed way of going about it, and therefore it doesn't work. Yeah? So when we had a single layer, we tried to keep all of our initial inputs close to zero, mm -hmm. close to the linear point of the sigmoid. But when you get to the second layer, the, when your inputs are close to zero at the start, mm -hmm. the output of the first layer is not close to zero. It's close to 0 0.5. So is the problem that we need to bias our sigmoids closer, like subtract 0 0.5 from the sigmoid output, so that the second layer has something that's also close to zero and is in a linear range? Very, very nice point. Um, I'll repeat it for the for the audience, uh, for the virtual audience. Um, we said that if we start our weight close to zero, then uh, what, the nice thing about it is that the first layer of hidden units, uh, the total net input is close to zero, and therefore they operate in the linear range and produce the average, the, something that's close to the output of sigmoid on zero, which is one half. 
and now the layer after that no longer gets uh, something that's close to zero. So sigmoids don't have to go between zero and one. They can go between anything and anything, and often uh, it makes more sense, depending on the situation, to let them go between negative one and positive one. And that solves that problem of yours. Um, another way of solving it is putting a bias. And, but you're right, if you don't do that, the next layer will get something that's not around zero, it's around something else. Now, if the weights are small enough, it might still be good enough, but if you have five layers um, and you initialized all the weights the same way around zero, then you're completely right that you will get a bias in the starting point, and that bias is going to get stronger and stronger as you go up. So these are all issues we didn't have to deal with in a single hidden layer. Very good point. Yeah? Yes, I can talk about regularization. I have it here. Um, it's coming up. So let me, move, let me move to it. Let me just give you the name for this. The problem of the gradient becoming more smaller, exponentially smaller in a large neural, uh, in a multi-layer neural network as you uh, go down towards the input is called the problem of the vanishing gradients a vanishing gradient. And there was a major stumbling block here. Uh, and the fourth problem with the, these limits is Neural networks were not very good at learning uh, time series. Learning a sequence, learning a time series, or learning from a sequence. I'll explain what I mean by that. Many phenomena that we're interested in are progressing in time. Take language. Speech, acoustics, is a process that progresses in time, time series. Uh, Written language, words, is a process that moves in time. Um, in such processes, uh, take language, for example. You, as you start reading a sentence, you as a human, you absorb some things and you remember them and they help you interpret the words that come next. So you create a context. If I start reading an article about sports and I encounter a word that could mean, you know, sports or something else, I know that I'm in sports, it helps uh, me disambiguate the meaning. So reading is not a static process of looking at one word and deciding what it means. It's a continuous sequential process. How did neural networks deal with it until 2000? Was mostly by converting it into a static process. Um, so a classic example of using neural networks for recognizing um, speech would be to take uh, to recognize one phoneme at a time, one sound at a time, and to do it from the area that you're interested in, what the phoneme is, and from the context on both sides. Or deciding on uh, the correct part of speech of a word. If you have the word saw, and it could mean the verb to see, or it could mean the implement to saw, the noun, um, you have to decide on whether, you know, you go into a network, you have to decide on whether it's a noun or a verb, you look at the, con at the words that come here and the words that come there, and the input is this entire string. So there would be many neural network programs that would operate like a moving window. You have a window, you make a prediction based on what's in the window now, and then you move to the next position, and there's no relationship between the two. You just treat that. It was kind of an ad hoc solution. Um, some, when you needed context, uh, the only way to, uh, that we started getting into that was through um, recurrent networks. Let me explain what recurrent nets are, and then we'll move on to how all these problems were solved, one after the other. Um, in a recurrent network, you have your original inputs, you have your hidden layer, one or more, um, and then you had another set, call them context neurons, 
they were technically part of the network, so everything is connected. But there was a loop somewhere in the network, such that the, after some number of layers, there was a connection back into these neurons. What that means is that some intermediate level of computation in the network, it could be very early on or it could be the output, was fed back in, to become part of the input for the next, for, for, the, um, next, uh, iter for the next application of the network to the next moving window. So one way of dealing with a time series is to look at the first k elements do a computation, and then the output gets fed in as additional context so that when you move the network, that output becomes part of an extension uh, of, the, of the input. It's a very particular kind of memory. It's a very fleeting memory. It's a memory that uh, summarizes everything you want from the immediate past as maybe a single number or as many numbers as there are in that, in that layer. But it's not memory that you can hold on to indefinitely. It only is there for the next um, window move. Okay? We'll, we'll come back to that in a little more detail when we talk about how recurrent neural networks are done today. These are the four limitations that made neural networks useful but not phenomenal. And amazingly, all four of them were solved in the last 10 years um, using what we call deep neural networks and a few related tricks, um, which made them now phenomenal. And by phenomenal, I mean that we still haven't reached the limit of what they can do, and they can do a lot more than what, what was possible before, what people thought they might be able to do. Um, it doesn't mean that we fully understand all the solutions. We don't. I'll talk about that too. Uh, many of these solutions are now more engineering and more art than theory because we don't fully understand them, but I do expect that we will understand them in a matter of some years. But I want you to first understand what problems deep networks came to solve. And just like in the case of figuring out the weighing scheme for grades, you don't need a neural network, you can do it with linear regression. I also hope that when you encounter a problem in real life, don't throw a deep network at it if it doesn't need it, okay? Um, you have to understand where deep networks are useful and where, um, where they make sense. Uh, I promised to talk about regularization in neural networks, so let me do that now. Um, if you remember, regularization has, uh, the way we implement regularization, namely pushing the solution towards a simpler uh, solution in the solution space, is by modifying the objective function, you have the loss function, uh, which is typically mean squared error or some other L norm or maybe log likelihood, something like that. Um, this is the error or how well your, your solution fits the data. And then there's another component which we combine with a weight, which is how simple it is. Simplicity. Sparseness, something of that form. In backpropagation, it's very easy to throw in a term for this. Um, here, let's say we have mean squared error, so that would be simply uh, half sum over d of td minus od squared. Okay, that's an example from this side. And what we would have on this side could be something as simple as the sum of the squared weights. So this is wi squared. i goes over the entire network. So this is a sin single index that I'm using now for all the weights, including the weights on the bias, the bias neurons, so the bias weights. So it could be thousands of them. When you do gradient descent, you take the derivative not only of this, but also of this. But the derivative of this is extremely simple. The derivative of this part with regard 
um, to any particular way wi is just 2 wi. So if you're trying to minimize this and this, you will be taking steps every, at every iteration. In addition to the step you take because of the error gradient, you will also take a step in the opposite direction of the weight. So if a weight is positive, you're going to make it more negative. If the weight is negative, you're going to make it more positive. In other words, you're going to shrink it towards zero. So the effect of this kind of regularization is that every iteration to push weights a small step towards zero, a step that's proportional to their size. So big weights are going to be pushed more than small weights. The result would be a network if you compare it to a network without the regularizer, it would be a network that would tend to have the same number of weights, but smaller. Smaller weights means you're pushed more towards the center of the sigmoid. So you're, for example, I mean, here you may not be pushed a lot because the, net, the, the unit has to do what it has to do to reduce the error, but there would be no reason for the weight for the network to be pushed further this way or further this way, this, this regularizer would push it back in. This is not the only regularizer you can use. This is an L2 regularizer because of the squared. You could use an L1 regularizer. A little tricky. Now if you want to take the gradient, you find that uh, the derivative does not exist for zero weights. But that's not as big of a problem as you might think. So the gradient of absolute value looks like this. So it's, uh, it exists everywhere except at zero, the derivative. That's not the gradient of value. I'm sorry. The gradient of absolute value is um, this and this, right? Thank you. Uh, the point is the gradient exists everywhere except in zero. In practice, that's actually not a problem. You can take the derivative. The chances, are, the chances that the weight would be exactly at zero are theoretically zero. Um, you can just hack it when they're at zero. You can uh, just ignore that case. You could use the gradient to push it down. What would be the outcome of something like that? Well, this should remind you of Lasso, right? except lasso is, um, is done analytically, typically not as gradient descent, although there might be ways of doing this gradient descent. Um, the result of applying L1 regularization is to tend to minimize the number of non-zero weights. You could also use L0. You can literally count the number of weights that are not zero number of non-zero weights. The problem here is that you may need to make discrete decisions about which weights to get rid of. These are not continuous decisions anymore. They are discrete decisions to remove weights. And people actually do that. Um, so one way of doing that is that every iteration of backpropagation to randomly select a subset of the weights and set them to zero. This has two effects. One is to, um, sorry, two different issues. It has one effect. The effect of randomly uh, removing weights, uh, each iteration different weights, is to make sure that the solutions become robust because they don't depend on individual weights. So the, the way the network does its job is kind of distributed across many, many networks many weights, or many units. Uh, the second uh, thing that we want to achieve, you will not achieve by removing weights, different weights at different iterations, but by removing weights once and seeing the effect of that. Okay? That would be computationally more difficult. You have to remove a weight, retrain the network, maybe starting from where you are already, so you're allowing other weights in the network to compensate for it as much as possible. And then when it reaches the end of its training, you check to see how well it does relative to how it did when it had the weight. And then you repeat that, remove another weight and another weight and another weight. 
You can do it in the opposite direction. You can start with a network that has very few weights, relatively, a skeleton network, and then add weights and see how much better it does when it has that weight. But these are much more expensive calculations. This is what I wanted to say about uh, regularization, unless you have other questions. All right, so let's talk about how these problems were solved um, in the last 10 years. The easiest one is this one, easiest to explain. Um, two, um, two or three phenomena combined to make the problem of computation uh, not as severe as it used to be. One is, uh, of course, Moore's law. Computers become more powerful. Um, the second is, if you think about uh, backpropagation, it is a, what we call an embarrassingly parallelizable problem in the sense that it's extremely easy, it's trivial to parallelize it, to break them out of computation on many, many processors. This is because the calculation of the gradient, uh, there's summation over all training examples. And gradient, or all derivatives, are linear operations. The gradient of f plus g is the gradient of f plus the linear gradient of g. So the gradient of one half of your data plus the gradient over the other half of your data is the same as the gradient of all your data together, which means you can parcel off your data, you can break it into um, multiple chunks, calculate the gradient for each chunk, the gradient of each weight for each chunk separately on a different processor, and then add them up together. So, backpropagation is naturally suited for parallelization. That's nice. The other thing that happened is we all wanted better displays and beautiful graphics. So there's a tremendous industry to develop for doing graphics, especially for video games. It's video games that really created deep learning. Um, <laughs> well, in, in a sense it is, at least a significant part of deep learning. Video games drove the industry to, to design chips, computing chips like CPUs, that were designed specifically for graphical applications. And what, is, what do graphical applications do? They have this big screen with lots of pixels, and they do parallel operations, massive array operations on all these bits. So these chips are called graphical processing units as opposed to CPU, computing central processing units. Uh, GPUs were not designed for neural networks, they were designed to drive your video games. But they were designed to be very, very fast for mathematical operations on whole arrays and matrices. And then neural network researchers looked at it and said, well, you can look at this backpropagation as one big matrix operation. Suddenly within each layer, what you're doing is matrix multiplication. Many of you asked if you could use you know, uh, packages to do that. Um, there's a way of even looking at the entire operation as some kind of matrix ma manipulation. So GPUs were recognized so starting around 10 years ago as being very nicely suited for um, running backpropagation and forward propagation as well, all these matrix multiplications. And that made a huge difference as a factor could be a hundred or more of speed up uh, because it's all done in parallel. So realizing that it's a parallelizable algorithm, realizing that there's hardware that was designed to do it super fast, um, and then uh, building the infrastructure, uh, the, the, the cloud came about and the virtual machines and the ability to parcel off work to many places and uh, the software to support all of that like Hadoop uh, to s split data and then uh, do the computation and combine it. The ideas existed before, of course, you know, parallel computation was, was well developed before, but the technology and the software uh, to run it smoothly was developed very severely in the last 10 to 15 years. So this kind of solved this problem, 
Of course, solved it to a point. Depending on what you want to do, you still might need to be Google to do it. Uh, you might need to have a lot of, of computation. But it put us several orders of magnitude ahead of the game. These are the more interesting, most interesting uh, problems, and they kind of go together. This is how do you learn intermediate representations? Uh, and this is how do you solve the vanishing gradient problem? And it turns out that there's a single solution that does both. And this is at the heart of deep learning. And that single solution is called an autoencoder. So let me explain to you what that means, and then we'll continue it um, next time. Imagine uh, that you are trying to learn the identity mapping of 10 of these are inputs. You have 10 inputs and 10 outputs. And you have a single hidden layer that has only four hidden units in it. This is fully connected to this. This is fully connected to this. You have training examples. This is the input, and this is the output of the label. This is x1 through x10, and another x1 through x10 all the way. And here you have y1 through y10. And y is the same as x. So what you're trying to learn is to reproduce the input to the output. It's a pretty stupid thing. But the catch is that you have to pass through a bottleneck. There are only four units here, and there are 10 units here and 10 units here. Suppose I gave you this problem and asked you to run web propagation. Will you succeed? Will you be able to learn this passing through a bottleneck? A lot of input, a lot of trading examples. In fact, I'm telling you, you can generate your own trading examples, as many as you want, because you know what the label is. The output is the input, right? Generate as much as you want, a million. I want you, at the, at the end, I want you to give me a function that no matter what the input produces the, it, at the output. Can you do that? It'll be very, very hard, because there's a finite amount, well, there, there is a finite amount of information, but suddenly there's less information that's harder to encode information in four units than in 10 units. But suppose I now told you that the inputs are all going to be um, somewhat redundant. That they're derived from something that's originally much lower dimensionality. That means not, you're not trying to learn to squeeze every input that way only inputs that come from a particular um, subset of the space. What the solution will, in that case, you have a better chance of finding a solution. And what the solution will do is it will basically compress the input. If the, if the input is compressible in a less, in a non-lossy way, or even in a slightly lossy way, you will be able to learn this mapping. So taking a real-world problem, real-world inputs, and giving them to this kind of network is basically asking the network to learn to compress the inputs. The beauty of it is that, A, we believe that naturally occurring phenomena are highly redundant in the sense that there is a lot of redundancy between adjacent pixels in an image, between adjacent signals in, a, in a speech, um, and if we didn't deal with that redundancy, we would have way, too, way more inputs than really the dimensionality of the problem. One way of thinking about what a good feature is, a good feature is a feature that allows you to reproduce the input it was based on without much loss. 
So you can think of a feature as a compressed representation of the input, compressed in such a way that it retains the important aspects of the input. Now, a good feature is a feature that throws away noise in the input and keeps those aspects of the input that are relevant for the output. The trick is we don't know what's relevant for the output. If you're trying to recognize your grandmother, we don't know exactly what aspect of the inputs are relevant for recognizing your grandmother. At least we don't know it in a systematic way. Here we're asking a somewhat simpler question. Find a way to throw away noise and keep only the stuff that's relevant to reproducing yourself. So we're replacing the difficult problem of mapping a very noisy, big input space into some known category like your grandmother or a dog or a cat with a different problem of figuring out what is it about the input that is essential and what is it that's noise. If you run something like this on natural images or most natural naturally occurring inputs, it will do very well and it will compress the information. Namely, the, the images, let's say this is an image, so think about it as a, a thousand by a thousand bits, would be represented by far fewer neurons here, but you will be convinced that that representation captures the essence of the input because you have a proof that it produces the output. Right? This output could not be produced without passing through here. There's no direct connections from here to here. So autoencoding is a very good way of compressing very broad input, very multi-pixel multi or multi-unit input without knowing what it's going to be used for. Some compressions are better than others depending on what you're going to be using it for, and it doesn't solve that problem. It just gives you a generic compression. But compression is something that was desperately needed um, to solve many of these problems, certainly the first one. And it turns out that compression is an excellent intermediate hidden representation. Intermediate representation, useful intermediate representation. So it doesn't solve the problem completely because you're not optimizing the features for the thing you're eventually trying to predict, but you're nonetheless creating useful intermediate representations. You're starting the step, the um, building the hierarchy. I should let you go. When we come back, we'll discuss uh, all the others and we'll, we'll decipher all the fancy new terminology that you hear, convolutional neural networks and LSTMs and anything else you want.